audience. Um, and for the folks in 901, Lynn has the course evals, and so feel free to fill those out um, and to give them back to Lynn, who will turn them in. Uh, we're always very interested in um, your reactions to uh, what we've done in the course and, and ways we might uh, alter it or, or keep it um, based upon your feedback in part. So thank you very much. Our guest today is Professor Lou Friedland, uh, graduate of Washington University at St. Louis, and Brandeis with a PhD, and uh, this is his last uh, seven days on the uh, paid, the last two weeks, I guess, yeah. or, or so. I'll still be working as a, as a paid member of our faculty. Yeah. Um, but uh, we'll never, um, we'll never be able to escape the confines of Vilas Hall and his many collaborators uh, and students. And so this is uh, many departments do a tradition called a last lecture, where folks all kind of come together and watch a person do a last lecture. We haven't done that but I thought I would try to make this a last interview, although, you know, last is, is not quite Ho the right hopefully term. Hopefully not. Hopefully not, although, you know, <laughs> Lou's coming over for dinner tonight, and so, you know, maybe things will, won't go well, and who knows what will happen. But, um, so I'm really happy uh, to have uh, Lou Friedland as our guest. Welcome. As always, we start by asking, why did you go to graduate school? <laughs> Why did I go to graduate school? Um, the, the short, honest answer is I just had gotten fired from a psychiatric hospital, not in a psychiatric hospital, but I was union organizing in Boston uh, in a psychiatric hospital and uh, citywide union drive. I got fired. I was appealing at the National Labor Relations Board and then eventually the federal court. And there was this course on Marx and Freud being taught at Brandeis, and I thought that sounds interesting. And they offered me, uh, after that course, they offered me uh, tuition and the big sum of 1200 bucks a year. So not any different, really. That, than was, <laughs> that, was, my, that was my grad support, 1200 bucks a year. So, and that's, and in and, and, and all honesty, I wanted to, by that time, I wanted to get back to grad school. So you're a person who has run large newsrooms You've trained in the culinary arts. You've been a union organizer. You have been an activist. What what draws you to the academy? And when you stayed here for thirty years, you did all those things for less time. What what drew you here, and what kept you? Here? I couldn't get another job. Um, <laughs> no, uh, you know it's a, it's a great life. <laughs> I think people people we all complain about it. I complained about it. Still do. <laughs> even today um, but it's it's one of the best lives that you can have in the in the United States I think maybe in the world if you can make a career researching writing thinking teaching um, get paid for it uh, get paid reasonably well even though we complain about our salaries um, it's there's really nothing better rich people have to worry about all their money and obviously it's not good to not have any money but if you can have your time, much of your time to your control over it. Um, it's a, it's the best life you can have, I think. And for me, um, it was a way to continue reading and thinking about things that I've been thinking about for a long time. What do you think about? Uh, <laughs> what do I think about other than food? Um, uh, you know, I. For a long time, I, well, that Marx and Freud uh, cl class that I took uh, back in uh, Brandeis, I've been thinking about Marx and Freud for a long time. Since I know this sounds pretentious, but I'll say it anyway because I get to. Um, since high school, um, I read books on Marx and Freud and thought there's something here. So that Frankfurt tradition is something that's kind of been in my blood for a very, very long time. And at the core of that tradition, which I think people it's easy to forget now as it's gotten more refined and more academic, but the core of that tradition is the central question of why, well, at the core of that tradition is the central question of why was there no revolution, <laughs> no socialist revolution in Germany? But that was not my question necessarily, but my question was how can social theory be put to use to make a more just, humane, and democratic society? So that's what I think about. I know it's, that sounds... I should never have said that. That sounds quite pretentious, but but that's true. I mean, it's it's why almost all the theory that I've done, all the research I've done over the years, leads back to that question. Why why that question? There are lots of things to ask. There are lots of things to want to know about. 
There are lots of disciplines. You are perhaps the most well-read person I've ever encountered. Why that? For me, it's the only question worth asking. Um, I'm not saying other people shouldn't ask many other questions, but for me, it's always been about how can we make a more just and democratic, certainly in this moment, society in the United States. Um, uh, I grew up during the civil rights movement. Uh, I was a little young, I was a little slightly, somewhat participated in my hometown. Um, grew up certainly participated in the anti-war movement in high school and then beyond. And uh, uh, so I've been concerned with questions of, you know, racial and, and other kind of economic justice for a very long time. And uh, uh, it's just, it's just, it's, it's what I'm most concerned about. So you have these concerns, you get a PhD in sociology, then you come to work in a school of journalism and mass communication, where of course you have the freedom to continue to pursue those questions. But from, a, from the point of view of an assistant professor coming into a highly regarded program that deals with one thing, and you coming from a different disciplinary tradition, how did you navigate doing what you wanted to do while fitting in here in your early years? Knowing, of course, that you come by journalism honestly with your prior career and you know that sort of thing. But Yeah, I think that's part of the, I mean, I, long story short, actually, it's not short, because I don't have to be short. Um, <laughs> we only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had, as you know, I've done work on social theory, academically, although my, my dissertation, I sw switched. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, it became clear to me that communication was the central ground of political uh, battle or contention in the United States. And that's why I got into TV in the first place. Um, and so there was a connection there too, but um, I switched and wrote my dissertation on cable from the original topic, which was on Habermas, uh, uh, to cable broadband communications, the control of industrial society. Um, and that, so I, I had made sort of an intellectual transition to the field of communication. I made a practical mm -hmm. transition to the field of communication. Um, but, uh, uh, but I never worked. I'd never worked in the field of mass com communication. Uh, I knew, honestly, close to nothing about it when I was hired here. Which was probably it's good that I'm. Say I gave my first lecture and or my my job talk in this room, so it's a good thing I didn't say that then. But um, uh, but but uh, I I learned communication on, by on the fly. I was lucky in my first years, I did work on, I wrote a short book on CNN and international television news, which is something I could do partly from my you know, general knowledge as a you know, journalist scholar and from my experience. And I did some work that I liked on mapping international television news. So that was my transition into the discipline. Um, I was very fortunate, uh, uh, had a, uh, a graduate student, Zhang Meng Bai, who was Chinese and a, for lack of a better way of putting it, a refugee after Tiananmen in China. Uh, he had, had to leave the country. So Meng Bai was my assistant and we did a, a pretty large study of coverage of Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, and so we looked at CCTV, Chinese Central Television, Taiwan Television, CBS, and CNN, and we did in-depth study of all of them. And we did it in, the, we were, I think, among earlier ones in the field to, do, to use, use that, do that based upon a set of ideal types. So we were trying to bring Weberian style histor historical ideal typical analysis, and at least those of you who have my classes know what I'm talking about, Weberian type uh, historical uh, ideal typical analysis into the analysis of news with the belief that only understanding the deep historical background of, of, of news as a as a set of institutions and of the and of the history of nations could you actually understand that so that was that was my academic transition in and then uh, then, there were, then other things started to happen but I also have to say um, that Hemet 
uh, Shaw, who I'm supposed to. I, don't know I think he was planning on zooming in. Yeah, but I don't know if he's here. But anyway, Hemet, Hemet and Joellen uh, Stair, who's left, retired a while ago from the department, um, were very kind and also gave me a car. We had a club of junior faculty. I won't say what we called it. It was kind of funny and not an irreverent name. Um, but uh, 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 they, they sort of helped me <laughs> learn what, what mass communication as a discipline was because I had no idea. I'm going to do a, a housekeeping note. If well, let us slide our chairs closer that way. I, I, I think way? that I'm getting information that they're having a harder time hearing on the Zoom. This will be imperfect. And is this thing on? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Lou flew in uh, from uh, Midvale and Boyer. His arm's tired. Uh, so, um, so you you start writing this work and you start to develop a support network with other junior faculty in the department. What were what were some of the mentoring experiences you had with senior faculty in the department, whether they be positive or less so. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, my single most important mentoring experience uh, was with Jack McLeod, who, as I've said before, basically taught me the field of mass communication. If not for Jack, I think I'd still be sitting around wondering what this field is about. Um, Jack is People do, people know Jack as a mass comm researcher, of course, and he's one of the was one of the is is one of the world's greatest. Um, but he also was a sociologist, so Jack um, and a social psychologist. So Jack allowed me to make that transition intellectually by essentially, well, we could talk the same language, or he translated problems for me. And Jack and I started doing some work together really subtle ways. Jack was the best mentor. Ever. Anybody who's ever known him knows that. Um, one day he said to me, I still remember, I can hear his voice saying, you know, what, what about community integration? It's like, what? <laughs> Why are you asking me that? I don't, I don't, I've never even thought about it. Now, I had been doing some public journalism research for some years by then, and of course, it had been community-based, and I'd written about community. But it was a problem in sociology that I hadn't thought of, but it was very central to his, his, his upbringing, if you will, as a sociologist, but also his thinking about the world, even though around here that wasn't sort of understood as being so central. So Jack and I wrote a piece together for an edited piece for an edited volume, and that just got me down the trail of community integration, community news, sociology, um, and really my civil society work that I continue to this day. When I was a graduate student, not as long ago as when Lou was a graduate student, um, I read that edited article in David Weaver's seminar at Indiana University. Oh, yeah. And Dave that. tells this story of how he was at a conference with Jack, and Jack was saying, we have this new person and we're gonna do this project. And David thought, well, that's not ever going to work in mass communication. And he told that story to lead into, and now I assign it in my mass communication uh, seminar because I was wrong and Jack was right. And David Weaver, in my very first ICA, I have to say this, uh, asked me a question about what my independent variable was in my, in my world television news uh, presentation. And I have no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> if I'm honest about it. I came from Brandeis. We had no stats and no methods, like literally it wasn't taught in the department. It was barely taught in the university, excepting at the Heller School. My comps were in German and French, right? So, so, uh, so, you know, Weaver, Weaver nailed me. And then Sharon Dunwitty, who some of many of you know, I hope you should know who she is, of course, jumped in and, and sort of deflected for Weaver, because otherwise it would have been a pile on. And, that would have been a very unpleasant first ICA. So, yeah. So Sharon helped me a lot too, um, uh, and I should mention Michael Fow, who was my tenure mentor. And Michael has passed a while ago. Um, did very different things than me. I don't think he even liked my work, honestly, uh, or particularly not, not disliked it. But he was so kind and, and helpful to me as a mentor. So I, I owe him a debt too. So you worked your way through the tenure process, getting mentored by Michael and Jack and Sharon and, and others and doing, and doing your own work. Once the, the, the freedom of tenure comes, what did you turn your attention to? Um, that's a good question. What did I turn my attention to? Let's see, the freedom of tenure. Well, the freedom of tenure 
happened around 1996 to me, and I was still doing a lot of my public journalism work at that time, and, and I played out that string, as it were, for quite a few years. But also, uh, Carmen Siriani, my lifelong uh, partner and uh, colleague, friend and colleague, um, it's been almost 50 years that we've known and argued with each other. And Carmen, by the way, I was right. Um, uh, um, uh, started working on a book that became Civic Innovation in America, and that was Carmen led that book, just to be super clear. But I was lucky to be able to focus on that. And so we we were working, doing work on civil society in the United States at a much sort of broader level than communication, and and I was able to pivot to that after I got tenure. What. What's your memory of the of the what you were trying to accomplish with Carmen in that book? Carmen was trying to get me to write it, uh, my sections uh, mostly. But um, uh, uh, no, what we were trying to do uh, was to sketch out a vision of civic innovation, which is the title of the book. It's always good to have the title fit what you're working on. Um, uh, in the United States, and our belief was that it was much wider and much much more deeply Im embedded than um, many people at that time thought. This was the time when Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, had come out. Everybody was essentially talking about there's no social capital in America, and there, there, that, just to be clear, there is a decline of the kind of social capital that Putnam studied, but we also knew, and, and really I give Carmen credit for this, understood that there were there were much deeper veins of civic innovation going on that were non-traditional. So yes, the the old Kiwanis clubs and women's clubs and, and, and associations were in decline, in no small part because women were entering the workforce, which Putnam never properly acknowledged in my view. But um uh but but in communities there were all these environmental organizations. In government there was all this environmental innovation people trying to, to change government in order to, especially, you know, uh, obviously not Republicans, if I can say that, and I can now, uh, but Democrats, when they were in office, were trying to change government, some Republicans, a few, uh, were trying to uh, change government to make it not just more responsive and certainly not just bigger, although yes, um, to make a more effective state, more effective government, but also to following the community action programs of the United States, which Carmen, of the 1960s, which Carmen was uh, quite knowledgeable about. He, he wouldn't, I can't say he was expert because he, he would say he's not, but he pretty much is. Um, how those community action programs had transformed the landscape of community organizing in the United States across many, many different areas. So, so, so we, no, but nobody, when we're talking about the decline of social capital, civil society in America is in decline, nobody even was taking notice of those things. So, you know, Putnam measured, you know, the lack of, you know, membership organizations. People had stopped, you know, joining local clubs and, and joined the Sierra Club, which is so-called checkbook organization. Well, but there were all these environmental groups all across the United States, watershed associations and forest preservation associations and rivers and stream stream uh, friends of and and he didn't take any account of any of that so we just thought empirically he was wrong but more importantly structurally um, there was something happening in the United States that was actually long and a deep current that we wanted to talk about brief uh, fourth wall breaking Katie can you hear any better than before I don't have, I just give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down because I have, the sound is off for Zoom folks. Is it better than it was or is it not? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Again, not talking because I can't hear you. Katie, thumbs up, thumbs down. Mitchell, thumbs up, thumbs down. So, yeah, sorry that the sound isn't any better. Okay, um, sorry everybody. You might have to, if you wouldn't mind trying to project, that might help. Um, so, one element of what you said there reminds me a lot of the work that you do um, with uh, with Devon and me and Chris and Kathy Kramer and John Peavy House and, and others related to one the value of understanding local information ecologies but two the way that they are integrated in complex ways with 
mid and larger communication ecologies. And I, and I would say, so for my money, one of the things that you have left an imprint on our discipline on is that one, the way mass communication operates in a society is much more complicated than we think. And two, even though one is true, that does not mean we cannot rigorously study it, elucidate it, um, interrogate it, analyze it, and understand the implications from it. And so t to talk a little bit about your interest in this set of overlapping information ecologies and how they it not just interact with communication, but the social structures that kind of guided some of the stuff that maybe drew you to graduate study in the first place. Sure. So even going back to the work with Carmen, and I want to also give a shout out to Kathy Campbell, who I see here, we did work on public and civic journalism together, and that was one of the currents um, uh, that led me to that, I guess, deeper understanding or more focused understanding on community and community structure. And so, and, and Jack's, of course, suggestion about doing work on community integration, but um, uh, community structures are complex. And I actually need to give credit to my spouse, Stacy Oliker, who's sitting over there too, who studied among other things with uh, Claude Fisher was her dissertation advisor. And it was Stacy who started me thinking about social networks seriously, um, even though I kind of knew they existed, but, but so, 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 Communities are connected by social networks. We all live in social networks. Whenever we talk about social media uh, or social networks, we're really talking about social networks, not just media networks, right? Although the terms have been collapsed today. And if I have one empirical analytical lesson, it's like, do not collapse those two things. Remember that social society exists still, even in this day and age, apart from social media um, and even communication. And so the fact that these are layered phenomena is really important because I would argue, some people would disagree with me, that society, pre, social relations pre-structure communicative relations. That's not to say that they aren't transformed by communicative relations, but when people are living together in, in a community, in a social, in, in social groups, social networks, they um, uh, are connected in ways that, uh, that make, we use that term affordance today sometimes. They make certain things in, in social life possible or more, or, or more difficult, right? So that the way that, that structure is really central to understanding communication. I don't think we can understand even mass communication, the effects of television, for example, without understanding that television and newspapers are embedded in communities. You know, Sue Robinson, who is here, I think, still, or maybe. On Zoom, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, studies uh, the impact of race uh, uh, and, and, and news in, in local communities. But you need to understand those community structures to understand, among other things, who's visible, who's not visible, why they're not visible, what role the media plays. And, and so as a, the more work I did, the more, and so, some of you might have heard, especially those of you who've taken classes with me, I've done work sometimes on Jürgen and Habermas, uh, who himself uh, bases f fundamental parts of his sociology on Talcott Parsons. No booze from my students. <laughs> um, and so, um, so system theoretical frameworks were really important to me, even coming from Habermas, and particularly that core system life world distinction, which again, I'm not going to explain it here, but many of you have been exposed to it. So that system life, life world distinction is fundamental to my thinking. But then the question for me as a Habermas scholar uh, was always, what does that actually mean, right? I mean, what, what does the life world look like? Well, the life world is an actual set of social structures. It's in communities. It's the way that people are socialized, the way that they're acculturated. And that whole set of relationships was central to how social networks were connected, right? People tend to, we, we've talked in other classes that I've given about homophily, about the power of, of homophily, the principle that we tend to associate with people like ourselves. And we tend to do that for, not for voluntary reasons necessarily, although sometimes we do, but sometimes we just do it because, hey, we're born in a neighborhood, right? You're born in a neighborhood. You might be born into a certain religion if you have a religious family or ethnicity, and those are the people you are socialized with, right? So those have lasting impacts throughout our lives, including in communication networks. 
And so I wanted to begin to figure out a network way of understanding community and, the, and a systemic way of understanding the flows between the life world and the system in communities. And that led to my piece on community, so another piece on community integration. Um, and then to connect that later to an ecological framework. Um, so uh, 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 I work with a number of graduate students, Nako Kim in particular, um, on developing ecological frameworks for communication. This is b before that was being done. And so um, because what are you calling? No, last thing I'll say about this. He knew he should have asked. It is me never this true when, when he says this. The last thing I'll say about this that is always a lie. <laughs> what are, I, and this this is this is the last thing at this moment. Uh, ecolo, even then, I'm skeptical. E ecologies are complex systems, right? That's really what an ecology is. Even a natural ecology is an extraordinarily complex system with multiple layers and multiple interaction effects, including especially interaction effects, right? So feedback loops, positive or negative feedback loops, determine the actual flow of information by ecologies, whether it's a natural ecology of forest or whether it's a human ecology. And so to me, that was the bridge between the life world and system in a formal analytical sense. Moving to an ecological framework in communication helped me to make the connection between those two fundamental layers of social life. For people just starting out in their careers, don't do what I do. <laughs> that, that, that seems to be bad advice because you're ending, you know, at a top-ranked department. You have a Cambridge book coming out the month after you retire. Done. It, done. <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday. Yes, sure, we did turn that in just yesterday. Actually, so. I had to finish one more query this morning, but it's done. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one one thing that seems to maybe may, maybe it's required, maybe it isn't, but one thing that you've done to help animate some of the work that you've been talking about for the last few minutes is been by uh, successful pursuit of research grants, relationships with foundations, the building of, of the resources that are required to fund graduate students, pay for surveys, pay for all of the incidental and unseen costs of qualitative interviewing, focus group interviewing, ethnography, transcription, uh, all, all of that. So talk a little bit about for these folks who are just getting started in their careers and for me, um, how you approach funding your work, especially when it's not always what is obviously um, so hot right now, to borrow from uh, Zoolander. Or in my case, ever. Um, but um, um, but uh, uh, it's true, be, so doing, doing this going. kind of work, and this is actually, I guess, a, a something to think about. If you do the kind of work that I've done, which draws in a lot of different areas, some of it's social theoretical, a lot of it's community-based, a lot of it, of course, is qualitative, but not all of it. I've had to carve out a path um, initially through private, you know, for private foundations, but nonprofit foundations, because the big funders, you know, NSF, NIH, absolutely, you know, there was no point in even trying to compete for those kinds of grants. So I put together, starting early on, a series of small grants. I've done a fair amount of work on comm policy, and some of my earlier grants were from the Benton Foundation and some others. Uh, uh, Devon was, that was, I think, Devon's first grant, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, that Benton Foundation survey, where he asked people um, some questions they didn't like, and I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, and then that he wanted to drive back in a blinding snowstorm from Washington, D.C., but that's a separate story. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but um, small grants, and the short answer is bootstrapping. So, so be, but the short answer is also, to the best of your ability, do, do two things. One, one is a piece of advice from my old friend John Cruz from my Berkeley days, which is keep two sets of books, not literally, <laughs> Not literally, but research books. Not literally. Any auditors from UW listening to this, which is unlikely? Not literally. But um, in other words, yes, you're doing a foundation report because they want to know about public journalism in four cities. What can you learn about those communities that are also going to contribute to your research program? And those grants are smaller, but they're also 
more focused on what you want to do. So the short lesson, especially for qualitative scholars or theory oriented scholars is do what you do as best as you can, what you want to do. Don't chase grants for money because A, you'll probably fail anyway. And B, if you get smaller grants that are more focused from foundations that fit what you're trying to do, you'll build up a track record that will allow you to pursue larger grants over time, right? So you need to you need to do it in a very phased and focused way. And the other thing that I learned early on was to not, you know, just to go for the lowest hanging fruit that you could identify. Uh, too often, you know, people, young scholars look for big grants. Well, big grants, you know, unless you're part of a research group, aren't likely to come anyway. So look for the money that's there to do what you want to do. And sometimes it's, you know, 10,000 bucks, which might sound like a lot now, but it's not a lot for funding a research project. But but that's enough to maybe, and back then, especially when I was getting started, you could hire an RA for almost a year for 10,000 bucks, or you could, you know, get out in the field and, you know, so, so look for the, the pots of money that are isomorphic with what you want to do. And a lot of times those are foundation reports so foundation wants to know about you know a certain area okay you do that report but again two sets of books not literally i stress again but you say okay i'm going to do the we just did a report for love wisconsin which is a really good organization that tells stories of wisconsin citizens and we used it to fund some of our qualitative work so it's just continued all the way through so you talked a few times now about the theoretical and qualitative orientations to your work and a lot of what you produce on your own or maybe in a one-on-one -on -one collaboration certainly reflect that. You also collaborate with people who do computational analysis, experimental analysis, survey research, panel survey research, and also collaborate with folks who integrate that with qualitative work. And one thing that I think stands out in your participation in these groups is that though you may not be the one we would ask to sit down in R and program the result Why not? For, for the quantitative work, <laughs> um, although maybe we should and that would be a delight. Maybe, um, maybe you, we should so we can get a couple extra rounds of reviews. That's right. <laughs> but the, the understanding of what each method is doing in terms of what we're able to see, um, what its limitations are, um, these are all critical contributions that you make, despite, as you mentioned, you know, training in French and German and not, uh, you know, quantitative research methodology. And so how did you develop those muscles over time to integrate what you're doing with people who have completely different, uh, well, I won't, I won't say completely different epistemological orientations, but completely different um, tools, methodological orientations, yeah. Um. First of all, I had to learn some math. Um, no, uh, I really didn't. Uh, <laughs> as Stacy will attest, I still am not very good. Um, but um, uh, the short answer is that, and we talk about this in some of my classes too, um, we, Jeff Alexander has this continuum of scientific research, which we've talked about, ranging from the very empirical to the highly theoretical, almost philosophical. And in there is a kind of analytical mid-range and that analytical mid-range comes down to what are the core questions here and how do you put them together and does this fit and does this make sense? And so a lot of what I've done, even that system life world stuff, which is of course very abstract, it's a question of how do we actually understand how certain things happen? What are the actual connections here? And so by paying attention to the connections among levels of analysis and of course specific research questions and problems, um, that's how I've sort of tried to make a contribution to the more mixed methods work that we've been doing. So there are three things I want to get to before opening up to uh, questions from, from others in about 15 minutes or so. One of which is related to uh, your role as a mentor uh, for faculty, for graduate students, for undergraduate students. And so this morning I received two texts, one from an assistant professor who said, I don't think you understand the mentoring hole that's going to be left for us when Lou leaves. And the second text I received was from a full professor who said, I don't think the junior faculty know what they're losing <laughs> when, when Lou leaves. And so, so, so both are wrong, right, in, in some sense. But um, I think I want to ask you, how have you approached mentoring 
faculty, both in our department and, and across campus. A lot of the work Lou does also is, uh, from a service perspective, sitting on the Baldwin Review Committee and you know, working with the Mortgage Center and all kinds of other things across campus that touch the lives of various faculty members in various stages of their career. How do you approach faculty mentoring? Faculty mentoring? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, I approach it when someone approaches me, so I don't, you know, stay out of people's business if they, you know, if they don't want me to be. But often people will come to me, usually with a specific issue or problem about whether it's publication or whether it's tenure trajectory or um, for other colleagues, sometimes it's, you know, it's, I counsel people about job choices, whether they should leave or stay. Good decision. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I honestly, it's hard to answer that question because I just give people, the only thing I can say is I try to give people the best, most honest answer that I can, whether it's the one they want to hear or not. And I try to do it in a way that I would want to be hearing it. So it's classic, you know, uh, what is hateful to you? <laughs> I'll quote the Jewish version, the Hillel version, but do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So another, they treat people well. Okay, so another way of asking this question is, my experience with your mentoring and my experience hearing about others' experience is that you have thought pretty carefully about what it means to live the life of a scholar. And I find that when we chat about things I'm struggling with, the orientation of your conversation comes back to those, maybe without ever explicitly saying it. But what do you think it means to live the life of a scholar? <clears throat> Easy questions, thank you. Mike. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think it, it, in a nutshell, it means probably, I don't know, two things, always two things, sometimes three. Uh, it means having, it goes back to that core question that we started with, having something you care deeply about and knowing why you're doing what you're doing. Are you doing it? And I, to me, that, that has to involve some connection to the world. And as a, I guess as a inveterate, you know, I don't know, reformist sounds so old and stayed, uh, but uh, someone who believes that, that we can make social progress, that, I would argue that that's the most important kind of connection that you can have, is how is my work actually contributing to make democracy better, civil society better, people's lives and community better, that sort of guiding set of values, and I'm, God knows I don't sit around saying my guiding set of values, you know, I just, you're, you asked me the question, but I think having a kind of guiding set of core values, and then having an intellectual trajectory that at least is trying to remain faithful to those values, meaning how is what I'm studying actually going to uh, advance them in some way, or it can it, maybe, hopefully. And then finally, so I said it was not really two things. Finally, reading deeply, and that's the one piece of advice I would give, I try to give it to any of you who are in, in 880 this semester know what I'm talking about. Um, and Jenny has been in other classes who I've tortured with many things uh, to read. Um, but um, read well and read deeply. One of my biggest concerns about this field is that, and in our field, but it's true in others too, but I think in COM even a little bit more, is that we read too much and too superficially across too many things. So when's this study done, that study done, I have to do my lit review, boom, 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 boom. What are your core intellectual orientations? Have you read the big books, or the hard books, that talk about the things that you really care about? Have you studied them? Have you taken notes on them? I know in a way, if you heard me talk about that, not that I do such a good job, but have you taken notes on them? Have you captured the core ideas? And are you, in, in C. Wright Mills's terms, are you building a file or are you building a way of capturing your work over time so that when you do hard work on a hard book, it's not just underlined, which I'm very guilty of, I wanna be clear. It's not just underlined, but you've actually had a dialogue with that book so that you can take the dialogue that you've had with that book and have it with others, including others in your field and your writing. So building up an intellectual 
space is really important. And, and it's so easy in graduate life today generally, but I think in our field maybe even a little bit more so, um, to sort of skate a little bit. There's just too much, too much stuff. And I understand there's this tremendous pressure. You want to get a job, you have to publish a lot. You publish, you publish more if you do things, more things. You do more things when you do them a little less deeply. There's always some trade-off there, right? But take the time to find the deeper currents of your work and invest in the, in the books, usually books, but, or core articles, and really learn them. So my second area was going to be graduate mentoring, which you've done nicely here with the, the, the advice about reading deeply. Other, other things that you think are a hallmark of what can help graduate students navigate their program, but also maybe their, their early career outside of their degree. Yeah, and of course, you know, short answers are pretty straightforward. Find mentors, etc. Find mentors and listen to them, or at least listen to them critically. Think about whether their advice is right for I'm you. I'm very good at listening to Luke critically. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I just want to say Mike never does what I tell him to do, actually. But, uh, but still, I appreciate that we talk about these things. Um, that's not true. He doesn't appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, mostly, it's just like, Really, can you actually do those 12 things simultaneously? I don't know. Um, but, um, and he does, which is remarkable. Um, you know, I, so one thing, I've, I just mentioned this a few minutes ago. Some of you have heard me, some of you have actually had me kind of tutor you on this. Figure out a system for note taking, an intellectual file in Mills' terms. It's one of the single most important things that you can do. I did this much too late in life or much later in life than I should have. Um, Carmen has a system of four pencils, red, green, blue, and black. I've never figured out what they actually all mean, but he has a way of capturing his notes systematically. You have to have a way of doing notes. You have to have a way of keeping files and revisiting your files. So that book, that short uh, piece on intellectual craft by C. Wright Mills that we've read in my graduate classes over the years, I strongly recommend it to everybody, whether you're still keeping files in that way or not. The core principle is the same, and and, 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 and that allows you, so Joe Lakito, who is, a, I think it's fair to say, is a, a mentee of mine, among other people, um, has really been, we've been working with that over the past years, and so the question is, how do you do the stuff you have to do, which is a lot, whether it's a grad student or it's a young professor, while still, and it's still that keeping two sets of books idea, while keeping the deeper currents while nurturing the deeper currents of your thinking and not getting lost in the stuff of which there's a huge amount that you're gonna be doing every day. And it's hard to do. I'm not gonna pretend like, oh, you know, it's easy, just keep, keep an intellectual file. It's a question of making time. You know, I would suggest blocking time, whatever your best time is for thinking and reading, not your worst time, not, you know, 11.30 at night or whatever it is, but in the morning for me, I think probably for most people it really is the morning, even though as a grad student I was trying to do things at 11.30 at night too. So find the good time and pay yourself first intellectually. And you know, I don't mean not pay others, but I mean pay yourself first, meaning capture the core ideas of what you need to work on and then move on to the stuff. Because the stuff can be done with when you're slightly less sharp. So we end J901 with a uh, lightning round of questions, which is never a lightning round, um, much to my chagrin, and then uh, open it up to a couple of questions before we hit time. And so lightning round begins with, what's the, your favorite thing you've ever written? Jeez. <laughs> I don't want to like anything I've ever written. But one has to be the, the, the least hated. <laughs> well, in scope, uh, yeah, you know it's not going to be worth it. In scope, it's civic innovation. I'm proudest of that. I think that stands the test. Uh, the network public sphere that I wrote with Hernando Rojas, who uh, was here, it's not anymore, and Tom Hovey, um, was, was a very, very important piece for me, brought in, bringing a number of ideas together. What's the most remarkable, notable, experience you've had with a reviewer? <laughs> I've, been, I've been incredibly lucky. I don't, and it's not because I'm good, it's really not, but I have had, I don't think I've ever had an article 
rejected. So um, this is not, really it's luck, and I'm not just saying that, it really is luck, the kind of stuff I've written and the fights I've written it for. Um, most of them were reasonable. I mean, you get, the, the worst ones are the ones who, who sort of think they've read Habermas and really haven't, and then that really makes me, that pisses me off. Tell, you know, because they've read one secondary work five years ago and start telling me what I should do. If there's one thing graduate students in their first year should know that will help them, it is? Set time priorities and block them carefully. You can't do everything, so determine what's the single most important thing that you need to be doing at any given time which is building your own intellectual profile for yourself with your advisor, and then let the other stuff follow from that. If you try to just circulate from one thing to another, it'll drive you crazy. And that's true of classes too. You take three seminars, four seminars, you literally, and you're TAing, you can't do it. I mean, I don't mean you can't, like it's hard. I mean, you can't literally, there's not enough time in the day. So you need to do proper triage starting early, like how am I gonna, you know, this thing in this class, I really wanna read this, it's really important to me, these other three things, I can quick skim or cheat, you know, like kinda barely read and set those priorities. Questions from, we'll start in the room and then I'll open up a couple to Zoom. Any questions I've left from you all the room? Speechless. <laughs> as usual. It sounds this is starting to seem like my seminar. Danny. It's also seeming like my seminar. I know you're gonna keep researching after retirement and working with people here in the department. What are your projects? What are you doing and like what's next? What's next? Okay. Um, several things. Uh, Mike, Chris Wells, myself, Devon, and uh, Nam Jin Lee are working on a redo of our, uh, I call it, we call it, call it our redo project, essentially culture and consumption, which we did back in 2006. And I'm rediscovering some really important work done by a guy named Mike Savage, who just has a giant new, excellent book. I've only got the first chapter or two done on inequality. So Mike Savage, and I'm trying to bring Savage's work back to the Bourdieu work that we did. Joe and I, Joe Lucido and I are working on some things about the field of social media in, in terms of social network affordances and strong and weak ties. Um, uh, so, so there's that. Um, uh, 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 Carmen and I are, and Carmen, Car it's really Carmen's project that I'm helping with on Civic Green, which is a great new project that he launched on retirement which is looking at ways that we can reinvigorate, or not reinvigorate, because it's being done anyway, but reinforce civic environmentalism in the United States, so that as we have a Green New Deal, it will be rooted in communities and, and also the transformation of governance. Um, I have my own work on civil society, my, you know, long, uh, and uh, I, rethinking the concept of integration and in, in the terms of the context of integration crisis, which some of you will recognize as echoing Habermas's legitimation crisis. I think we clearly have a crisis of integration, but I don't think we've given adequate structural explanations. And then I want to go back and start Bella's, <coughs> Robert Bella, fabulous, great, one of the greatest sociologists of the 20th century, wrote a book called Religion and the Evolution of Society which um, I'm, it's the first thing I'm going to crack when I'm done with this semester. Oh, we finished our book. No, uh, yeah, uh, our book will have, I don't know, Mike comes up with three new paper ideas a week, so I'm sure I'll be working on some of those. I feel Stacy seething at this level of stuff to do after retirement. <laughs> and, I will do more, and I will do more housework. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, and maybe one other question from the room before I'll ask Zoom. And if the folks on Zoom, there's a feature on the bottom of your screen that says reactions, and you can um, raise your hand with that function so I know you'll have a question. I promise that we won't get to everyone, but we'll, we will try to get to someone. Jenny. 
Um, Lou, I know you've collaborated with uh, both students and faculty outside of the US. So how did the um, international collaborations with both shape your thinking about the big problems in communication and the field study? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Jenny. Um, you know, I've done a fair amount of work on China. Not, not, not that I've done, to say I've worked on China is really wrong. I'm not a China scholar in any way, shape, or form sense of the word, but I've it had a long standing interest in China and my work on, you know, the Tiananmen work and the world comparative work from a long time ago. So for a long time, I, I, it just it, it forces me to understand that, that the structure of democracy in the United States is not unique. I mean, rather, it's, it's distinct. And also that that civil society and that problems of democracy take many many different forms, and so it keeps me honest on it really more than anything else. Working with my particularly my uh, they've tended to be students from Korea and China. I see a, a number of them here. I'm not going to name check because I'm going to miss somebody. I just, There's more than one page. Yeah. Of Zoom. Um, uh, uh, but also Manisha in India. So. Um, uh, so, uh, just it keeps me honest in realizing that the United States is, you know, how can I put it? I'll put it directly a hegemon, meaning it, it has a distinct position of power in the world, but it uh, is not, uh, doesn't control the shape of other societies or nations. Is there a person on Zoom who has a question they would like to? Ask of Professor Friedler. It looks like uh, Carmen. I see your hand up. So if you can um, unmute uh, and then um, put Lou on the hot seat. Yeah, if you can unmute without tech support. <laughs> um, it's not so much a question. It's I just want to say that it's been a blessing to have known Lou. He met when I was a grad student, and he was still an undergrad, and been a huge blessing first of all just as friendship um, and it's so great to see some of his family here and secondly that I got a chance to work with him because we had this strange pathways crossed at a time when I was coming back to Brandeis and he was finishing up which was wonderful and um, you know I, I totally treasure uh, the work he's done and I will say just to thanks to your department, um, not only for hiring him, uh, of course, but for nurturing him for so many years. And, and this is true. In the last week, I have had two very intensive dreams. I've woken up and talked to my wife about them. And the dreams were I was out there visiting and I was overwhelmed by how brilliant and exciting the faculty and the graduate student I was like completely intimidated because it was this place that was so amazingly rich now I, you know I haven't been out there to, to see it but I know from talking to Lou for so long you know that that's the case and the people who are here now and also some of them who have moved on and so just as a dear friend of his and, a, and as a colleague and scholar, I so appreciate your department. I can't tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carmen. What he means is thank you for hiring me, because otherwise he would have had to deal with me for all these years. <laughs> <laughs> but he has anyway. That may be so what he meant, but it was it still didn't, nice. Didn't, didn't <laughs> really help. Thank you, dear. Want any, uh, any last Zoom? It, it, it would be really help if people use the hand raising feature because I see people on the second page. But I see Devon. Go ahead, Devon. I'll just say, <clears throat> echoing uh, Carmen's uh, points, you know, it's Lou is a tremendous influence. He's been a great mentor. He's shaped the thinking of so many of the department. His imprint on the field is as much through his mentorship and his shaping of other people's thinking as it is through his own scholarship and the students. It's, it's kind of remarkable when I think about um, how much he's been a mentor to so many of us on the floor. I mean, his impact, just as it ripples through the thinking of questions around sociology, democracy, how we make communication serve people better, 
it shaped so many of us on the floor and in the field. And for that, I thank you. But more than that, I thank you for all the fun we've had, my friend. We have, we have had this, it's been a great journey together and it's not over. So you're not going anywhere. You're just retiring in name, but we're not letting you stop doing all this cool stuff. So Stacy, sorry, <laughs> we're, we're, we're keeping him engaged. There's no way we're going to let him go. That, and, uh, it, it, has, it is a blessing to have you as both a friend and a colleague, as a mentor, and as a, a partner. Thank that, you. Thank you. That is a how I, I, I would also like to end by saying, despite the incredible value of the scholarship uh, that Lou has done um, and the way that the scholarship has influenced the pathbreaking research done by faculty and graduate students on this floor, um, we didn't even get to Madison Commons and the training of journalists, for example, uh, on this floor in, in, in one hour, um, to the way that it shaped how the other scholars of, say, the Knight Network does its work and how they think about things, to folks across the globe, to the, the mentoring work. For my money, it's, it's the balance of the fabulous dancer, chef, jazz piano player, good friend, uh, that, that makes this uh, a loss to us in terms of the membership on our active faculty. But of course, as Devon said, you aren't going anywhere. And now, since you won't be in any meetings, we know that you'll be free to do more stuff. So this is fantastic uh, for, for, uh, for all of us. And so I think what we'll briefly do is conclude our hour, but then if folks on Zoom want to chit chat with Lou, we can maybe make that happen. Um, I'm not sure if this room has another thing happening at noon but so i want to make sure to be sensitive to what other folks might be doing in here but we'll keep that going if folks might like to engage um with, with, with Lou for, for, for a few minutes before we move on to our next research meeting but before we do that if the folks on zoom might unmute and if the rest of us might join me in thanking professor friedland For folks in J901, if you could fill out your course email and get to win, that would be great. Thank you, young again. Yeah, I, I know that you have a lot of research going, so I don't think you're actually retired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.